All right, so I think that we are ready to get started. Um, I wanna thank everybody for joining us this evening for the next installment in Vibrant's educational webinar series. Um, we are super excited this evening to have Dr. Brandon Brock um, discuss the gut-brain connection with us. And so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Brock. Um, he is a practitioner in Dallas and um, has a incredibly lengthy background here. Um, I won't read through everything, Dr. Brock, uh, but basically the things that you need to know is um, he has a, a doctorate in family nursing from Duke University, doctorate in chiropractic, a diplomat of functional neurology, nutrition, conventional nutrition, and integrative medicine, um, holds a fellowship in childhood disorders, neurology, electrodiagnostic medicine, neurochemistry, and is a member of the International College of Chiropractors. Um, Dr. Brock will talk a little bit at the end about his work with the BTB group. He and a couple of partners are um, I basically have been instrumental in um, some of the projects that we've done with them at Vibrant here and um, huge champions of our testing. And so we are immensely grateful for, for their help as well as their involvement and, and participation with some of these. And, we couldn't be happier to have Dr. Brock this evening to kind of talk about this really interesting case study. Um, I think uh, it's one patient, is that right, Dr. Brock? One patient case study? Yeah, it's kind of kind of one sort of flowing situation mm -hmm. that goes through, you know, a, a bunch of material that gives kind of a big picture. Awesome. At least that's the plan. Yeah, well, um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna give you control of the slides and um, give me just a second. All right, you should be able to go forward and backwards, and I'll let you take it from here. Okay, great. Well, you know, hey, look, I just want to say thanks. We, uh, I know that uh, I do have a couple of partners in this, and I just want to kind of pay homage to them. It's uh, Russ Teams and Trevor Berry, both of them doctors, and it's been really one of those amazing journeys to be able to really work with Vibrant. I mean, you know, there's a, there was a time where we were sitting around and we were making our seminar series and we we're like, you know, we need a lab that's going to actually be able to do something and, and have good specificity and, and good sensitivity and has some research behind what they're doing and has some technology behind what they're doing. And what we found is, is, is vibrant. We found a company that, that can do the vast majority of what we want to do. I mean, of course, there's really no lab that does everything. And that's pretty much just the truth. But we found one that does pretty much everything that we want to do. But the biggest thing that, that I would say is, is what they do do is high quality. And I don't have to worry about screwy results or something that's just way off. And so that makes me feel really good. And, and I can use them consecutively and, and their labs will show me one study. And then if I do another one, it will show me the next one and then the next one. And so it's very comparative and it's really nice to be able to have that. So you don't have to flip through your charts. But the biggest thing is this, they're cutting edge. They're, they're looking at the gut and they're looking at the nervous system and they're just looking at good old fashioned things. Like I use their thyroid, I tell you, I use their thyroid panel all the time. So as a, you know, one of those things is, you know, it's, it's just really important to be able to do just some good old fashioned labs that is complete. And, and I like that. Um, as you can see on this slide, one more here is my wife, Tara. She's the person, uh, she's the English teacher, and she is the one that makes me basically not misspell my own name. So I got to I got to give her a lot of credit. Plus, she's a health coach and is doing a lot of good work, too. So, you know, we got a good team. We enjoy this relationship, and I hope you guys enjoy kind of what I'm going to go through tonight and what we're going to do. I do practice in Dallas, Texas, and just do as much as I can to help patients. That's pretty much all I'll say. I work at a couple of different clinics and, and we do everything from, from, from neurological services to stem cell services. So without any further ado, we'll uh, kind of get rolling here. If I can, uh, you know, make the slides advance, there it goes. So our goals really throughout this is, and before I get going on goals, I just want to say for all of you that, that, that tuned into this, I mean, I know it's later at night for some of you, some of you it's earlier depending on where you're at. Thank you very much for tuning in and, and actually spending some time where you are going to learn and the learning can be used to make your patients better. I, I can't tell you how important that is. Um, it's just one of those things that you know tomorrow or the next day or the next day, you will use some of this stuff, whether it's 
the lab itself or the information that you learned from what we talked about in regards to the labs. At, at some point in time, you'll use it. So thank you very much for being here. And it's always really nice to be able to talk to a, a group of people that, that actually care. It's really nice. So anyway, back to what we're doing, and that is our goals are to review labs and, and really pathology that is related to gut function. So I'm going to try to stay on that topic. Of course, I'll get off of it. Um, review the connection of the two systems between the brain and the gut, which is, I think it's very important because if you get a brain or strike that, if you get a, if you get a, a gut that is leaky and there's inflammation and let's say you got a parasite or some sort of bacteria and it gets through the barrier system it, it sort of breaches the wall, if you will, and it sneaks into the system, it will trigger an inflammatory response. And that inflammatory response can really become sort of hyperstimulated or it can become uncontrolled. And all these barrier systems have a lot of systems or a lot of things in common. A lot of the proteins that latch them together are very similar. And so if you get a leaky gut, you'll get a leaky brain sometimes. So the inflammation from a leaky gut can sometimes go into the brain and end up creating problems. I mean, anything from neurotransmitter dysfunction to inflammation to systems that just don't synaptically connect. And then if that happens, and for some reason, if you have enough inflammation and your parasympathetic nervous system doesn't work right, then that in turn will go back down and make your gut even worse. So the whole reason for knowing these goals is to understand one thing. Your gut can lead to brain dysfunction and your brain can lead to further gut dysfunction. So you have a gut brain, brain gut loop that if it perpetuates itself, it can really turn into a nasty, nasty situation. And the problem is 99.9%, .9%, and of course, that's a made up statistic, but it's only something I can imagine. A large percentage of neurologists would never, ever, ever consider themselves as a gastroenterologist or send them to a gastroenterologist to come up with an answer for the neurological problem. It's too far off. It's like, going on the other side of the equator or something. They, they just can't even imagine that there would be a relationship. But the literature is really overwhelming. And when I say overwhelming, I'm, I mean, this is good literature from good universities and good randomized studies where when you do it, it's done correctly. So we'll review this pathology and review the connection of these two systems that are these loops. And then I want to kind of bring conditions that fall within that loop. And you know, really so that you can understand the immune system and the inflammation and maybe even some of the autoimmunity that fall within that gut brain, brain gut loop. And there's a lot of things that fall within it. Um, I've seen anything from kids that, I mean, just today, autoimmune encephalitis where a kid is, has autoimmunity to their own brain and that autoimmunity is turned into severe behavioral disruption. And that behavioral disruption has turned into just bizarre activity and their parents are completely, they, they, they don't know what to do with themselves or the kid and they don't know how to discipline the child. They don't know how to deal with the outbursts. This has to do with developing thyroid antibodies. This has to do with developing, you know, gonadal antibodies. This has to do with developing pancreatic antibodies that will damage the pancreas. There's so many things. And then in the brain, of course, we have cerebellum, we have basal ganglia, we even have different types of NMDA, which makes limbic problems. So without getting too sort of techy here, if you get a breakdown in the brain gut, gut brain loop, your brain can be screwed up and your gut can be screwed up and you'll see symptoms in both. So the thing I would say with the goals is this, if you have damage to your gut, always ask about the brain and of course the gut. And if you have problems with the brain, always ask about the gut. So ask about both sides of the system. And what you'll end up finding is this. People that have really bad guts, like SIBO or C. diff or H. pylori or whatever the case may be, a lot of times they're depressed and have anxiety. And then a lot of times when somebody has a neurological disruption where they have any of those problems, a lot of times they have a bad gut. So we're finding a correlation that if one system is bad, the other system is bad. So we've got to check them both out in order to do our due diligence. So the things that we want to look at, and, and the patient, this particular patient, 
presented with stomach pain and gut pain with grains. Now, this is not unusual, guys, and, and I want to say something real quick. One of the things I'll do is if somebody has gluten problems, I won't just take them off gluten. Sometimes I take them off the, the gluten-free grains, you know, some of the things that they replace the glutens or the gliadins with, quinoa or rice or tapioca. It's very, very common to get a tapioca reaction that's just as bad as the gliadin reaction. So I just want to say be careful of that, please. If the inflammation from grains gets bad enough and it goes into the brain, an inflamed brain, the code word for that is brain fog. Uh, coordination issues, the code word for that is my cerebellum is not doing so good, so that's Purkinje cells. And then there's all kinds of cross-reactivity. So if I make an, uh, an antibody to one tissue type, it's very easy for it to cross-react with another tissue. So it can happen to things, and if you look right here, I'll, I'm going to try to use this thing here real quick. Maybe it'll work. So if you look at that, it's very easy to get joint pain, or it goes into the skin and the immune complexes build up and we get skin rashes, or maybe our peripheral nerves get damaged and we get damage to the feet, or maybe our Leydig cells get damaged and there's hypogonadism, or maybe there's damage to, let's say, the adrenal glands and aldosterone's not regulated, so sodium's not regulated and we get high blood pressure. And of course, there's some, most of the time, there's, a, there's a, a other triggers to this. There can be viruses, bacteria, parasites, but a lot of times these viruses kickstart this whole thing. And this weekend I shared a story about a patient that had COPD, and COPD is very, very bad about triggering inflammation and that inflammation turning into autoimmunity and that autoimmunity turning into damage that equates to rheumatoid arthritis. So guys, people that are smokers, you've got a chance for them turning into somebody that has rheumatoid arthritis. And then of course, if you're getting bleeding because of fragile capillary beds or their red blood cells are breaking down, we can get these hemosiderin stains and that can have a lot to do with iron. So this is what this person has. They're their gut hurts. They don't really, they feel like they're in a cloud. They're really not coordinated. Their joints are hurting. They're getting these bizarre rashes and they get burning in their feet. And of course, their testosterone is probably so low that they have no libido left. Their blood pressure is out of the roof. They have multiple viruses because over time, it's just a fact. We accumulate these and that's just what happens. And they have COPD. Whether it's COPD from secondhand smoke or COPD because you're a smoker, it doesn't matter. This person, I'll tell you, was a smoker. And then they had this hemosiderin stains. And you can see this on the elderly patients a lot of times. It's these big, bright, uh, these, these bright uh, sort of red blotches that get on people's skin. And it's just a breakdown of red blood cells. And you get heme. And heme is very basically toxic. It's inflammatory. And it takes something called a haptoglobin to clean it out. And so we don't like that because... If you're if you have frag you know you fragile capillary beds in your skin, you may have fragile capillary beds in your brain, or you may have fragile capillary beds or vasculature in your heart. So you can be a, a heart attack risk or a stroke risk. So this is what this patient presented with. And the thing I want to show you is the tangibility of the labs. Because right now, just looking at this, you don't really have much of an idea of really where you want to start. I mean, there's all kinds of things we could do. A lot of people that know a lot about joint pain, they'll just jump on that. A lot of people that know about peripheral neuropathy, they'll jump on that. A lot of people at low T clinics will jump on this hypogonasm and think, and think it'll just clear out everything. But you have to put this all together into one big story because most of the time there's a connection between A to B to C to D and so forth. So the most important thing is really trying to figure out what the connection is. And, and so that's something that we'll actually kind of try to look at here. So let's look at a genetic panel real quick. This is something that Vibrant does that is really cool. And I gotta tell you, it's, it's way cheaper and it's part of the panel and I don't have to order it separately. And it's the DQ2 and the DQ8 you know, genotypes that give us you know, a haplotype or a reaction. So when we have DQ2 or 8, what we're saying is, is that the body is genetically ready to become sensitive to gluten. And if you look down here, 
You can see that HLA DQ1 doesn't quite bind to this molecule, four doesn't quite bond to it, but two and eight binds to the gluten fragment. So just to kind of read to you, there's a range of possible DQ proteins. There's, I think there's up to 50 of them, okay? So people that have DQ2 and eight bind gluten fragments more strongly, and these can trigger an immune response much more easily. So now, when you're HLDQ2 and eight, you have a higher probability of the immune system sort of sniffing it out and saying, hey, look, look what just snuck in. This uh, HLA-DQ system, which is part of the immune system connecting a naive T cell to a CD uh, uh, cell that actually will have a phagocytic response. When you eat this, it will recognize it now as a pathogen and, and do something about it per se. So DQ2 and 8 is something we like to look at. A lot of times you will not have any other responses to any of the other gliadins or grains, but these are the first things that you may see. And when you see this and nothing else is positive, one of the things you can say is, is, Hey, look, this guy's at a risk for developing celiac disease. Let's get them gluten free or grain free before their genetic predisposition turns into full blown celiac disease or, or gliadin intolerance. So I like this test because, it kind of gives me some foreshadowing if there's going to be a problem or not. And I think that's very important for people, especially when you're looking at younger children. And I diagnosed my youngest daughter off of these uh, DQ genes. Um, it just made me think, you know what? She was HLA DQ positive. There's gluten fragments that come through the, the epithelial layer through the gap junctions. And there was a problem. And I knew that if I kept feeding her gluten, that it was going to get really out of control. So. As we do this and we find that these DQ2 and 8s are here, the DQ2 haplotype, which is just describing a genetic response, <clears throat> is the highest genetic risk for celiac disease. So for those of you, and the reason why I like to say this is because a lot of people say, I, I, why would I order this test? I don't understand any of it. Well, when you order this test and they're DQ2 positive, you can change their entire world by just saying, you know what, you need to go grain free and you definitely need to be gluten free. And I will tell you this, it only takes the amount of gluten that's the size of the tip of a, a ballpoint pen to have a complete immunological response. So they really, you, you need to teach them extremely well how to be gluten free because if you don't, they have a giant genetic risk for celiac disease. And if they get celiac disease, one of the things that happens is their immune system comes back up and it starts to eat the barrier system. So they end up getting villus atrophy and then everything leaks through and they get malabsorption, they lose weight, they get vitamins A, D, E, and K deficiency, they get protein deficiency, and they really start to look sick. Some of them look like they have cancer after time. It takes a little bit of, you know, it takes a while to get to that point, but it can happen. DQ8 is really not the single highest, but it's a major risk that is tested with DQ2. So if you have DQ8, you can almost probably take it to the bank that you're going to have a problem. DQ2, you're going to almost definitely have a problem. And these are beautiful tests because once again, they foreshadow what is coming down the road, even if everything else is normal. So it's not that I would say just order this separately. This is really part of the panel that we're gonna be talking about. And uh, I think it's important that you understand really what these guys do and what they mean. And so after looking at these, uh, you know, HLA, DQ types of panels, let's look at the gliadin panels. And, and gliadin is just code word for gluten, okay? It's a type of protein. So here's the thing. If you go to these traditional labs, they're gonna look at one lab. They're gonna look at one type of gliadin. We know there's multiple types of gliadins. There's basically anywhere from 15 to 17 components of gluten. So you have about a 1 in 17 chance of having a positive finding if you use a traditional lab. I would call that very, very, very low sensitivity. And the specificity obviously is not good because it may just be to one part. You know, one part. And I'll show you which of the gliadins that we usually test for with a traditional lab. So as we go to this right here, it's really nice because it gives us total IgG and total IgA. So total IgA, if you, if you kind of, let me see if I can draw this out here. I may be able to do it. 
you have in your guts what's called a slimy layer, and this is where your microbiome lives, okay? And then underneath that, you have these little armed guards. And this is your IgA system. It's part of your immune system that protects things, okay? And then underneath that, uh-oh, I don't know if that's gonna work. You have these cells. And these are your gut cells. And then there's these little gap junctions in between that hold things together. And then underneath that, you have a bloodstream. So knowing what's going on with your IgA will tell you if you have a good gut in general. So let me tell you a little bit about IgA. If you have an immune response and that immune response activates a naive T cell. So let's see, let's say that there is a naive T cell down here, or I'm sorry, a dendritic cell. And this dendritic cell phagocytizes things and it phagocytizes things by doing this. It reaches up through the gap junction and it samples the food up in your intestines. And if it doesn't like it, it goes to a Peyer's patch and that Peyer's patch says, hey, what's going on? I'm a naive T cell sitting right here, okay? And so that naive T cells, what do you got to tell me? And that dendritic cell says, you know what? I found something, I don't like it. And so it tells it everything and then it can polarize. It can go one direction and turn into a Th1 cell or it can go another direction and turn into a Th2 cell. These Th2 cells have a tendency to turn into Th9 cells through interleukin-9 or interleukin-10 and these guys end up producing IgE. And IgE produces some really interesting thing. It's a type 1 hypersensitivity. So we have total IgE. And the reason why I say IgE is because IgG, when it's high, can, per, can really push IgE. So if your IgG is high, it, uh, it pushes IgE, and IgE makes anaphylaxis. These IgG responses are delayed hypersensitivities. These are mucosal hypersensitivities. And then we got IgE, which is immediate hypersensitivities that can cause anaphylaxis and you need to carry an EpiPen. But nonetheless, I just wanted to tell you that. So it gives you these immunoglobulins, which you need. And then the transglutaminases are really cool because as gluten comes through, it's aminated. And so a transglutaminase deaminates the gluten and makes it a deaminated gluten where it can now be digested. So when we get antibodies to transglutaminases, and two is for the actual guts, there's one called transglutaminase three, which is for the skin, and six is for the brain. So when you get a TTG6 or a TTG3 or two, right here, two, this is for the guts. And if you get a problem here, you can almost be assured that you're gonna get celiac disease because when you get tissue transglutaminase antibodies, it's gonna screw up your deaminated gliadins and it's just gonna turn right back up and go attack your lamina and it's gonna cause chronic villus atrophy and you're gonna get celiac disease. And then everything sneaks through, lettuce, tomatoes, uh, I sound like I'm describing a cheeseburger right now, which sounds good. But the bottom line is we don't want antibodies to TGG and we don't want this deaminated gliadin. Now, there's a lot of people that say this. I can go to Europe, doc, and I can eat gluten all I want. In America, they take gluten, they stick it in a vat. And then in the vat, they stick a transglutaminase. Because when you deaminate it, it makes it last a lot longer. But they stick it in these vats. And in the vats, you grow these smuts, or basically a smut is an aflatoxin, which is a fungus. So by the time you consume it, it's already been deaminated, and it's already got a transglutaminase in it, so your immune system is like, what the heck, I don't know what this is. Now, I wanna warn you about one other thing. If you get a steak that is shaped like a heart on Valentine's Day, it's probably got a tissue transglutaminase in it. Tissue transglutaminase is used all over the place to shape meat. It's called meat glue. 
So if you have celiac disease, and even if it's just good old fashioned meat, stay away from meat that is not shaped like meat. If it's shaped like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and it's in a chicken nugget and it's Christmas time, there's a good chance it's got a trans glutaminase in it. So if for some reason they haven't used this and it's not a deaminated gliadin and you're in Europe, there's a good chance that if you have just antibodies to deaminated gliadins, you're going to be able to eat the wheat because it hasn't been deaminated yet. And this is the people that can eat wheat and wherever they want to go. So we go all the way down. I'll kind of jump through this a little, a little bit. There's these things that zip these cells together, and they're called zonulins, actins. And these guys zip the cells together. There's also something called vinculins. And these are the guys that keep these cells together. See these little lines right here? So nothing can get through. Now, the dendritic cells can still reach through it. It has a way of molecularly working its way through it. But a lot of times, if these are broken, whatever's hanging out up here, a bad guy, it'll just slip right through, go into the bloodstream, activate the immune system, and the immune system is now off to the races. So we do not like to see zonulins like right here. Antibodies are high because the level's high. So these guys are high, and now we're making you know, immunity to it. So this person, by all stretch of the imagination, probably has unzipped their cells, and they probably have a leaky gut. Now, the actin is also part of something that keeps this together. And then the LPSs or the lipopolysaccharides are the byproducts of gram-negative bacteria that can actually end up creating a problem with our immune system and end up creating damage to this gap junction here or the actual connection between the cells. So right here, if you have this, there could be bacteria. Right here, if you have these, there could be a leaky gut. If LPSs are negative, but these are high, I might go with the notion that there's not infectious disease. So we got to look for something else. Maybe they have just good old fashioned autoimmunity and it's decided to react there. Or if they have these LPSs, maybe I do a stool test and I look for something like, you know, infectious disease. So I hope you guys are kind of getting this a little bit because it all really does fit together pretty well. And I think I'm going to have to fix my mouse here. All right. So we're going to keep going here. Now, transglutaminase 3 is for the skin and 6 Six is really for this. When you have transglutaminase six, what you're really reacting to or what you really have is this. You eat gluten and you don't react to the gut anymore. It reacts to the cerebellum. So you have celiac disease of the brain. Right here, you have celiac disease of the skin. Two is you have celiac disease of the gut. Now, I know this sounds strange, and this is a major paradigm shift for a lot of you, but the literature is very clear that six is a neurological mechanism and it has a high level of cross-reactivity to Purkinje cells, and these Purkinje cells live in the cerebellum, and they give you timing, coordination, and everything that's cerebellum, whether it be speech, hand movement, connection to the frontal lobe, whatever it may be. If we have six pathology, I start looking for cerebellar disease. If I see three pathology, I start looking for things like random rashes, like why in the world does that person have a rash? If it's two, it's the good old fashioned gut related celiac disease. Now you can see this patient has a wheat germaglutinin problem and I'm gonna show you what that means here in a minute, but these are very bad. They suck your vitamin D out of your system. And the bad thing about vitamin D is this, vitamin D activates the T regulator cells. And the T regulator cells are the ones that keep you from getting autoimmunity. So I don't like to see this with autoimmunity. And this patient definitely, let me tell you, has autoimmunity, okay? So when this agglutinin or this wheat germ is this high, we end up seeing people with obviously autoimmunity to a component of the grain. And notice I say one component. Um, sorry, hormone, not vitamin D. Thanks, Russ. Um, there's several of these that are called hormones, that are actually hormones, not vitamins. Um, but this, what we call is, and most people, most literature calls vitamin D, this hormone is low 
and it really needs to be above 20. If it's below 20, the one thing that happens is this. You're gonna lose T reg cells, and when you lose T reg cells, it's kind of like the, uh, the bouncer at the bar has decided just to leave and everybody can go crazy, all right? Now down here, the cool thing is we have all of our gliadins. We have alpha, alpha, beta, gamma, omega. These guys right here are the ones that are the real gliadin proteins. Now a lot of times, one lab will just test gamma gliadins. So you may only get one out of all of these. Now the other thing that you gotta watch out for is the gluteomorphins and the prodynorphins. So if for some reason, and this person doesn't have it, thank God, but if they have a reaction to gluteomorphins or prodynorphins, what happens is every time they eat a gliadin, it turns into an opiate. So this is the person that will come into your office and say, you know what, I became gluten free and I feel like I'm gonna die. I'm sweating, I have fever, I am doing terrible. And what they're describing is withdrawals because they have an opiate-like response to gluten and they're gonna crave it and these are the hardest people to get off of it. So when you see these positive, you need to warn your patients, look, you could have some withdrawal findings and they're not so pleasant, so please don't judge this test within the first week to two weeks. But this guy has a moderate risk to alpha, and to gamma and to omega gliadins and wheat germ agglutinins and then other components. And so it's not looking so good for them. I mean, I would automatically tell this person, please quit eating grains because it's just not gonna be a good thing for you. All right, so let me take this off right here. I think I know how to clear, voila. Okay, so things to consider. Antibodies to actin, that was part of it. You know, it leads to uh, a leaky gut. Antibodies to zonulin leads, leads to leaky gut. Or increased levels of zonulin leads to a leaky gut. So one thing you can remember if you're a newbie at this, a leaky gut is just a door opening that lets something through that shouldn't go through. An undigested protein, a bad bacteria, or anything else that should be digested before it is really absorbed through the gut barrier. So actin's responsible for regulating the between the cell flow across the epithelial layers, okay? So it suggests that there's epithelial damage leading to increased intestinal permeability. Whereas zonulins are the gatekeepers. So the actin is the actual cell, and the zonulin is in between those cells and it's the actual gatekeeper. When there's leaky gut present, the intestinal lining is compromised, allowing undigested proteins. So most proteins get broken down you know, into monoamines like tryptophan or tyrosine, things that turn into dopamine or uh, serotonin later down the road. We don't want large polypeptides to come through because these polypeptides look just like a virus and that virus will create an immune response and everything breaks loose. So when you don't digest proteins because you have a leaky gut, your immune system is gonna look at it and say, hey, 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 look at that, that's a virus or something that looks very similar to it. And your immune system is a bit paranoid. If it looks similar to something, it will react to it anyway. So it just does. And so when we see these onulins, the gatekeepers, they fail, we may not have these completely digested proteins, and so they escape and go through and get into the bloodstream. Now, I'm going to give you something real quick. It's kind of off topic. But if you by any chance have a low thyroid, your thyroid is what makes the uh, hydrochloric acid in your stomach, and it's what breaks things down. So if you have a low thyroid and low stomach acid, and the stomach acid is not breaking down the proteins, and then the proteins go into your gut and they leak through as a polypeptide and not a monopeptide or a monoamine, you now have autoimmune disease. So a lot of people think, oh, thyroid is just good for hair, skin, nails, the lateral part of your brows, but it's very, very imperative for making stomach acid. So if you don't have it, you get things like SIBO or you get things like protein that doesn't get digested and it goes through the gut lining and you get autoimmune disease. So it's really important that when we look at these stomach things and we say, oh my God, it's leaky. 
maybe I should look at thyroid. That might be the genesis of something that's actually causing this to be worse than it really is. So I'm kind of connecting things together a little bit and jumping off topic, but I want you to understand that other organ systems really, really have a problem here. Now, catch this loop. The thyroid breaks down, stomach acid breaks down, I don't break food down, it gets digested as an undigested molecule or, or an undigested substance, goes into the immune system, creates an autoimmune reaction that goes back up to the thyroid, and now we have Hashimoto's, the thyroid shuts down even more, and so we have another vicious thyroid gut, gut thyroid loop. And the thing in the middle is the immune system. So it can become really nasty. All right, so let's get through this. So things to consider, we've got these gamma gliadins, these omega and these alphas, and what these really suggest is this. Let's just make it simple. You've got sensitivity to gluten. The gamma component, the omega component, the alpha gliadin component. The bottom line is, if you have reaction to these, just stay away from it. If you have reaction to these, and tissue transglutaminases, stay away from it. There's another lab that you can run on an outside, on the outside, like through just standard lab companies, which is endomesial. So if you have endomesial antibodies and transglutamin transglutaminase antibodies, and you have uh, gliadin antibodies, then you probably have celiac disease. Now, here's where you need to be careful. You really can't diagnose celiac disease, true celiac disease on any of this. What you need is an endoscopy. So listen to how crazy this is. You have to do an endoscopy, and they have to find villus atrophy. And they can say, you know what? It looks like celiac disease. What we're going to do is take you off, or we're going we're to put you on gluten for the next six months and see if it gets worse. So they put you on gluten, and it gets worse. And then they say, you know what? For the next six months, we're going to take you off and see if it starts to rebuild. And so they take you off and it starts to rebuild. So a year later, after having an endoscopy and we have further damage and then we have regrowth, there's the potential to say that you have celiac disease. The question beg, that, that I beg to offer is this, how many autoimmune diseases did you create during that time period where you had a leaky gut, where Naive T cells turned into something that was crazy and now you've got these antigen presenting cells and you've got a TH1 or a TH2 response and it's turned into true autoimmunity. I've seen people during that year time period where they're going through this quote unquote challenge test where they got thyroid disease and intrinsic factor antibodies so they got pernicious anemia. So I think the antibody tests can say Look, dude, if you don't slow down, you're going to get the real type of celiac disease, which is diagnosed on, you know, these endoscopies. Let's make it to where we don't even have to go there. You're going to get there. Trust me. And it can take up to five to 10 years to get to the point to where you have this chronic villus atrophy. And by then you've lost weight. Your fat soluble vitamins are gone. Your A and D is gone. Your D regulates your immune system. E and K are gone. So now K is gone, so it creates dysbiosis, and this is K1 and K2. So everything can become really, really problematic. So the related information is this. Your gliadins constitute a class of proteins in wheat and other cereal, which give it the ability to rise properly when baked. And these types are the gliadins or alpha, beta, gamma, and omega. All right, so if you have these things, the automatic reaction is just take them off. Because if you don't, this is what's going to happen. So here's a lipopolysaccharide. This is produced by bacteria. Here's a toxin. Here's a probiotic that can either make things better or worse. And here's a pathogen. Bottom line is they can sneak through here. Here's our zonulins. Here's our vinculins. Okay. So if it, if it sneaks through here, it goes to what's called a phagocytic cell. And there's three of them. There's dendritic cells, neutrophils, and macrophages. And the dendritic cells are the major ones. So dendritic cells will gobble this guy up and then it will start to break down its intracellular components and say, you know what, this is a such and such. And then this dendritic cell through a very, very, very sophisticated, complicated system will communicate with this naive T cell. And this naive T cell will say, you got a what? All right, we got to do something. 
let's create a Th1 response that makes more phagocytic cells through TNF alpha or inter interferon gamma, and it goes back up and eats the lining here. Or it says, screw it, let's make a B cell. And B cells make wanted signs. And these wanted signs are called antibodies. And it throws out antibodies that stick onto tissues and everywhere that that is stuck onto, the phagocytic system comes by and eats it. And if things really get bad, this naive T cell will turn straight into interleukin-17, which goes right into B cells, and that creates an autoimmune response, which creates antibodies. Now, the problem with this is these antibodies may react to one tissue, but also another tissue. So everybody goes through Th1 and Th2, whether they get sick. But when you get autoimmunity, it's Th17. And then you can end up creating multiple forms of antibodies that go to other systems. So this is right out of a paper, guys, that was produced by a major university that looks at gastroenterology. You can see right here a dendritic cell reaching up and sampling what's going on to determine tolerance, oral tolerance. So there's really, and this you're going to think this is crazy, there's two things that create oral tolerance, camel milk and donkey milk. <laughs> so if you've got a camel out back, go milk it. Good luck milking a donkey or breast milk does the same thing. Now there's other nutrients that also regulate this and I'll go through it a little bit later on. All of the other milks stop oral tolerance. It doesn't matter if it's cow milk or goat milk. Some people will say, hey, look, can I drink goat milk and not cow milk? The answer is no. All of the other milks cross-react. And those are casins and whey's and stuff like that. They all react and cause problems if the proteins are undigested, sneak through, and they cause one of these responses. So I want you to understand, Th1 can go cause tissue damage through phagocytosis. Th2 can activate B cells or plasma cells, which are memory cells, and it can activate macrophages or make other antibodies, which then tag tissues, and whatever's tagged gets eaten. And then, of course, we can have an interleukin-17 or a Th17 response. Now, I want you to understand, Th17, a little bit of it preserves this whole lining, but a lot of it promotes autoimmunity. So you got to have some of it, but you can't have too much of it. So these are really all things that you want to look at in regards to the immune system. So check this out. We have a gut lining. Now we have tissue transglutaminase that deaminates this. And now we come down and there's an HLA DQ2 or 8, which allows this antigen presenting cell, which ate the gliadin, and it allows it to cross react to a CD4 T cell, which is a helper or promoter or more of a naive T cell that turns into a B cell and that B cell then differentiates into a plasma cell and you make more and more antibodies that can be to the tissue that it reacted to or to a cross reactive tissue. In this situation, it reacts to tissue transglutaminase and we have that and it ends up creating damage to the lamina or the cellular component of the gut and you start to get villous atrophy. That's called celiac disease. So this slide is really a slide that you can go down here. Here's the reference. This is from 2012. This references how celiac disease develops. Now here's the cool thing. There's nutrition that we can do that blocks this. Brush border enzymes protects this. You can become gluten free. Uh, there's different products where there's immunoglobulins that can protect this villous layer. There's anti-inflammatories that can block this. And there's other nutrients that can stop this reaction, especially vitamin D. So there's things you can do. There's also diamine oxidase uh, regulators that can stop mast cells and B cells, mainly mast cells, from depolarizing and making histamine which brings more immune cells to this party and it just gets worse. So really some cool stuff to think about because if you can't tie the nutrition or the drugs to the labs and what the labs are saying, then the labs are kind of pointless. All right, so these are all things 
that really, if you were going to look at it, you can go back and look at these things and make sure that you understand them. And the good thing about being able to play this over, which I hope you can, is I'm talking about so much that it's really nice to be able to go back and replay it. And then if you want, go find your own references. I always challenge you, find a reference to what anybody teaches you. If you can't find it or if it's wrong, then of course, correct yourself. Now, there's something that's called non-gliadin proteins. And of course, here we have the glutenins, but down here we have serpins, ferronins, amylase prote uh, protease inhibitors, globulins, and purinins. This is what makes this test unique from other labs. There's a lot of other labs out there that look at uh, gluten and all kinds of pathogens that can create uh, you know, problems along with gluten, but these guys are a little bit different because when they're screwed up, they can create inflammation that a gliadin creates, but it's not a gliadin. It's just a separate protein. So as we do this, and we go and we look a little bit further, these purinins, serpins, ferronins, amylase protease inhibitors, and globulins are all responsible for one thing, that's inflammation. So when I say inflammation, that equals damage. Sustained inflammation equals autoimmunity. Super sustained inflammation equals polyclonal expansion, molecular mimicry, and now instead of reacting to one protein or one gland, you react to a whole bunch of others. So very few people have one autoimmune disease. They have several, okay? So these guys are about 25% of the total protein content of wheat. And these, this group of five non-gluten uh, proteins are distinctly different from the gluten proteins themselves. So I found a lot of people that have chronic inflammation and these five proteins sometimes are all five positive or just three are positive or one or two are positive. Um, Cindy, I don't know if the slides will be shared. I'll let Vibrant make that decision. I'm sure not the entire PowerPoint, maybe just a PDF. I'm not sure. So let me tell you what these guys do. Serpins are protease inhibitors. Okay. Uh, suicide substrate inhibitors. They uh, may serve to inactivate uh, a protease of grain boring insects. All right. The amylase and protein inhibitors, they're abundant and they serve as storage proteins for developing grain and a source for essential amino acids uh, and those who consume wheat products. So these guys can create product, uh, problems too from a storage mechanism. These from grain boring insects. We've got purinins, and this is a native protein uh, that is composed of long and short arms and really linked to uh, uh, tritis, uh, tritison precursors. Um, and this is really dealing with another component of what the proteins can do that are non gliadin related, that are gliadin related, related but not gliadins themselves and they can create an inflammatory response that deal with destruction of surrounding tissues. Now, this is a slide for serpents. So if you had these guys, and I just wanted to throw this up here, this is right out of 2011, which is about the cutoff for literature that I would use for this. But if you have a problem with this protein, tumor suppression, blood pressure, breaking things down intracellularly, controlling pro-hormones, blood coagulation, your complement cascade, which helps you with your immune system inflammatory responses, protein fold folding that makes them appropriate, cell migration and differentiation, and then really the big one here is eight, is modulation of the inflammatory response. The problem is, is that if serpents are off, you may modulate or dismodulate your inflammatory response. Okay, so Jeremy said something right there. I hope you guys caught that. But anyway, you don't want this guy to be off because if you do, you may already be inflamed because the gliadins are up and you're already inflamed because the gut barrier is breaking down and you're already inflamed because you have dysbiosis and now putting serpent on top of it just further perpetuates the inflammatory response. I hope you guys understand that the common theme of all of this is inflammation. So when we look at this, we have Proteases can break down the epithelial lining. Proteases can break down the common sural flora, which is the good bacteria or other bacteria. 
We can end up killing dendritic cells, which are the guys that should be there to be a protector, not a polarizer. Proteases can break down T cells, B cells, and natural killer cells that are going to do the job if something sneaks through. They can also make it to where you have an inappropriate mast cell response, macrophage response, or eosinophils, neutrophils, and this is the other phagocytic cell. Basophils are really related to IgE responses and a Th9 response. So proteases are pretty darn important when it comes to sublaminar or intra sort of you know gastrointestinal floral type of regulator. You, you don't want to have that guy be messed up because if you do, you're going to end up having inappropriate uh, immunoglobulin cleavage. Look at this, inflammatory mediator. Again, it's, a, it's an inflammatory mediator and it breaks down the tight junctions and it causes cells to blow up. And again, it causes more inflammation and more joint pain and it causes cells to migrate where they want to go. A lot of times at places where you don't want them to go. And then it really allows microbial invasion through the, the gut through mucus cleavage. So this is just a really nice slide that's, again, all the way back to 2016, just about a, a year and a half old. So let's look at some other gut markers and important factors. This is vinculin. So vinculin is kind of like zonulin. Now, vinculin is highly related to SIBO. So when you see this guy go up, SIBO stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So the best thing I can tell you is if you picture a neighborhood that has a bunch of houses in it and everything's overpopulated, maybe there's some bad guys in there, maybe it's all good guys, but there's just too many people. The problem is you get bacterial overgrowth and that bacterial overgrowth can turn into cells that produce hydrogen, which cause diarrhea. So that's the way I remember it is the kind of the H sound, hydrogen diarrhea or methane and constipation. So when you have these vinculins, the biggest question you ask is this, when you eat sugars or starches, do you get bloated and feel like a basketball, you know, like you're going to blow up? And a lot of people say, you know what, if I eat certain foods, I've got to unbutton my top button because I can't button them anymore because I'm bloated. That's a good sign that you may have SIBO. Now, the problem with SIBO is that it eats proteins, so you get protein deficient. Um, it eats fats, so you get fat deficient. It makes something called lithocholates, and that breaks down the gut barrier. So SIBO can actually create a leaky gut. So this is something that you want to know. So it's not always the best idea to give probiotics to somebody with SIBO, or at least certain types of probiotics. Some are good, some are bad. But if you give the wrong kind, you can just overpopulate an area that's already overpopulated. Okay, so now I threw ferritin down here. Let me just tell you why I did this. Because if you have malabsorption, then you can get anemia because you don't absorb iron. Now, at the same time, if iron's normal and ferritin is high, that's considered an acute phase reactant, which means you have inflammation. It's sort of like a C-reactive protein, okay? So I always look at ferritin, compare it to iron. Iron binding capacity will go up if iron goes down. So think about that. On the cell, your binding capacity is going to go up if your iron goes down because your iron binding capacity is going to become as sensitive as possible to scoop up every piece of iron and picture ferritin as your bank account. It's stored iron. So whenever your iron becomes low, you just, you just sort of borrow a little bit of ferritin and your iron stays level, but your ferritin starts to drop. Okay. And if your iron is normal, but your ferritin goes up, it's an acute phase reactant because remember macrophages need iron through something called a Fenton reaction to actually create immunomodulation or immune reaction. So you've got to have these guys in order to either absorb. If there's malabsorption, this goes down and all gets screwed up. If there's an inflammatory response, it's acute phase reactant. Look and see. When this is an acute phase reactant, your iron binding capacity will be normal. If it's iron deficiency, then this will go up. 
Now there's one other lab you can do that I would suggest that you look into and it's soluble transferrin receptors. And it's very good to look and see if you have an anemia from iron deficiency anemia or if you have um, some sort of chronic disease that is creating some sort of iron issue. And if you look at the ratio of soluble transferrin receptor, it will help you understand the whole game of iron and how it relates to malabsorption versus chronic disease. Because you could have normocytic, normochromic anemia that could be a problem. So I love that test. It's not on here, but it's something you can run separately through basically any conventional lab. Okay, so molecular mimicry is something that actually exists. And these vinculins uh, are part of you know your SIBO reaction. So this gentleman here, Pimentel, proposed that many patients with irritable bowel, irritable bowel is code word for SIBO. During previous episodes of gastroenteritis, they develop antibodies and cross-reactivity to vinculins, which cross-reacts with intestines or screws them up, and it causes irritable bowel syndrome. So irritable bowel is thin, small stools with bloating at each meal with certain types of foods. So to evaluate this, they started doing these vinculin antibodies. Thank you, Vibrant, for doing that. I'm so happy. Uh, they analyzed 162 patients. That's a, that's a fairly okay sample size. It'll get bigger and bigger and bigger as they go, and they'll, they'll do more and more standard deviations based upon the growing mean or median or mode of these uh, patients. Um, and really, they found out that uh, really there was a correlation with inflammatory bowel disease. So they found that patients with irritable bowel disease had a much higher level of antibodies against vinculin. That's the sim simplicity of it. Whereas those with inflammatory bowel disease had higher levels of anti-CDTB antibodies. And furthermore, patients who reported a history of acute gastroenteritis had the highest levels of antibodies against vinculin. So acute gastroenteritis, that's, you know, inflammatory, you know, gut, bowel, that's brand new. Um, some of the things, I'll tell you some statistics. The highest thing, uh, the highest condition to give you inflammatory or to give you SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, is uh, alcoholism. I believe it's up to 90% of alcoholics will have SIBO. People on PPIs, an enormous amount of SIBO. Um, people that have thyroid disease. And then the older you get, the higher the possibility of having SIBO. So you can actually look online and find a breakdown of statistics that shows you SIBO is out of control. If you're an elderly person that is drinking way too much and you're taking a PPI because you have GERD, it's almost assured you have SIBO. All right, so the one thing we found here is um, this test for antivinculin distinguished patients with IBS from those with other conditions at an 88% specificity and a predictive value of 94%. Now SIBO kind of sucks because it sticks around for a long time if you don't treat it the right way. And it's just a difficult disease to kind of get rid of. So you kind of have to know about that. And if you have this acute gastroenteritis and you have dysmotility, or one of the things that happens is this, the SIBO creates an inflammatory response that goes to the enteric nervous system and stops gastric motility. So these are the people that end up with coffee enemas out the yin-yang, and then they get these vinculin antibodies that break down the lining because they have all kinds of uh, you know, byproducts that break down the gap junctions, and then SIBO develops because they have hypochlorhydria and they don't kill off any of the bacteria, or they don't get rid of the bacteria, and then what happens at the ileocecal valve, when you have a lot of gut formation, it pushes open the ileocecal valve, and your flora from your large intestine comes through into your small intestine, which makes the disease completely worse. We don't want that. So now let's go from the guts to the brain, because I've talked a little bit about the guts, and you can see here's the guts, and here is you know, short-chain fatty acids. We've got probiotics, prebiotics. We've got endothelial or uh, intraendocrine cells. But right here, we have a breakdown, and then we have the enteric nervous system, which is really the guy that wraps around the intestinal system that causes peristalsis. The interesting thing is the vagal system controls it. 
So the vagus nerve brings blood down and it says this, Hey, look, uh, you know, I want you to stay healthy and I want you to not break down and I want you to have nutrients and I want you to have controlled cytokine responses. So your vagus nerve will make digestive enzymes. It'll control your salivary responses. It creates peristalsis in your guts. It controls the P450 system in your liver and then it controls, and this is really interesting, in your spleen, T cells will bind with B cells to make antibodies that create the possibility of molecular mimicry. An appropriate vagal response stops that. So when you have a bad gut and you end up getting a bad brain and you have too much stress and everything's breaking down and you have too much cortisol, too much or not enough cortisol will break down your gut lining, allow things to penetrate through, go up to your brain, inflame it, and one of the first things that shuts down is your parasympathetic nervous system, which further perpetuates the gut. So listen to this. I've got a gut, brain, brain, hypothalamic, hypothalamic, adrenal, adrenal gut loop. I've got a brain or a gut, brain, brain, vagal, vagal, spleen, spleen, gut lining loop. You can make all these loops. It's super fun because they, they all connect together. And in order to be a really good clinician, it's one of those things that you really have to be able to do. So let's look a little bit at the peripheral and central nervous system. We've got tests for the gut to see if you have problems. And then we have tests for the central and peripheral nervous system. And when you put the two together, you can start to say, hey, look, we've got a problem in one and a problem in the other. And we compare that to the physical examination. And voila, we have a neurological problem or a gut problem that has started to create an issue in the other system. So right here, we have our tubulins. Now tubulin in this situation is part of the intracellular structure. Myelin is the covering. So this person right here, we already know they had gut problems. We already know they had, they had zonulins and occludins. They had vinculins and they had problems with gliadins, and there was a lot of stuff going on. We already knew they couldn't eat grains. They were eating grains. They had problems with gut permeability, and because of the gut permeability, they more than likely could have cross-reacted with brain. So in this situation, it wasn't so much brain as much as it was myelin basic protein. So this is the thing that actually coats the peripheral nerve. So we know that they're actually reacting to their own myelin, this is really, I mean, this right here is worth the price of the whole test. I want you to see this. They have anti-S100B gliadin or anti-S100B IgG and IgA and IgM. These are your blood brain barrier markers. So I would just kind of say this. These are the zonulins of your brain. It's, you can kind of look at it like that. It's, it's not the same thing. It's obviously not the same structure. And please don't tell anybody then I said S100B is a zonulin. It's not, but it does the same job, okay? So when you get really bad antibodies to this, the person starts to break the brain down. Enolase is related to a breakdown of the myelin of your optic system. So one thing I would tell you is this. If you have somebody that's starting to get visual problems, always check NMO antibodies. That's not part of this panel. It's, it's kind of a standard test. Neuromyelitis optica, and then always check for MS. And the way you check for MS is you do typically a spinal tap and you look for oligoclonal bands. So the oligoclonal or oligodendrocyte is what myelinates the central nervous system. And then you do an MRI and you look for those big patchy white matter things. And, and everybody has those over the age of 50, or a lot of people do. A lot of it's just ischemia. But if near the posterior portion of the brain or the posterior portion of the corpus callosum, you have large spots, that is very, very indicative of uh, multiple sclerosis. I just thought I would tell you that. Now, GM1 and GM2 is peripheral nerves. So now we have somebody with myelin problems of the peripheral nerves. And I told you this person was getting burning in their feet, but they're not diabetic. So how many, this is, this is the mystifying thing. There's a lot of people that have these peripheral nerve clinics and they're just sure, absolutely sure that this person is going to have a peripheral polyneuropathy, but they don't. 
or, I mean, they do, but they're, they're going to have diabetes and they don't, or they're going to have some other condition that can actually create a polyneuropathy. Now, I want you to understand a few things that can create a polyneuropathy. Thyroid disease can do it. Infectious disease can do it. Uh, if you have intrinsic factor antibodies and have no B vitamins, that can do it. Or you can have GM1 or GM2 antibodies. That can also do it, along with myelin basic protein antibodies. So when we look at this, we're like, well, their blood-brain barrier looks okay. And that doesn't mean that there's not an inflammatory response going on in the brain. But we know their myelin's being hit, and it could be GM1. So let's go a little bit further here and say, okay, what could trigger all this? Like, what's going on? So they've got GM1, and they've got GM2. And they've also got HSV1. So now forget about the blood-brain barrier. HSV1 is cold sores. It's already in the brain. And what happens is this is making constant inflammation in the system. So at BTB seminars, we're going to be doing a seminar, I think it's uh, April 7th and 8th. Um, anyway, you can go check it out at btbhealthsystems.com. We are going to be ta talking about what these immune or these infectious diseases do to the immune system all the way across to brain, to gut, to the endocrine system, to everything. And this is just one example. I've got a simple cold sore. That simple cold sore increases your chances of Alzheimer's disease or dementia by 20%. Why? Because you have to have a constant immune response to keep this guy under control. Because if you don't keep him under control, you're going to get Bell's palsy or you're going to get vestibular neuronitis or another problem in the brain. So right here, this person has antibodies to their cerebellum. They've got cold sores. They have antibodies to their peripheral nerves. Now, why do you think I told you the person was having coordination problems? And now this person, it's not unusual for, you know, to see this. I even quit testing for this in some of my patients because it was so positive. Every time somebody saw herpes on a test, they automatically thought their husband gave it to them or their wife gave it to them. So they would start, you know, throwing punches. They could have had this for years. So one of the things I just want to tell you is be careful with that. Um, but these are really interesting because they all go together. So the cerebellum and the Purkinje cells are both in the cerebellum. And so what Purkinje cells do is this. All deep cerebellar nuclei activate the brain stem to do something. The cells that modulate that are Purkinje cells. So if you don't have good Purkinje cells, you don't modulate the output of the cerebellum, so it becomes screwed up. The rest of these could be basket, stellate, uh, climbing fiber uh, cell types, um, all the way up to different types of cell bodies that really don't have to do with Purkinje cells. But remember, when the cerebellum is broken down, you may have a tremor that's intentional. You may have a titubation where your head shakes. You may have engaged nystagmus in your eyes. You may have pendulous reflexes. As you try to do a finger to nose, it may be off. As you try to play the piano with your fingers, one hand may be slow. As you move your hands in rapid supination and pronation, one hand may be off. There's lots of things that can happen to people that have this. So going just a little bit further. The good news is, is that the vibrant tests give you a description of what these things do so that you don't have to go look it up, which is amazingly awesome. I got to be honest with you because... A lot of people would love to use a neural zoomer, which is what I'm showing you right now, but they don't know what in the world it means because they're not a neurologist, right? Well, none of the other neurologists know what this means either, so don't worry about it. You do the test because they have neurological symptoms, and then this describes what GM1 is and myelin basic proteins are. This is right out of, I mean, this is right off of a test, okay? I'm just going to let you know that. And this shows self gangliosides are found in autoimmune neuropathies. GM2 gangliosides is potential for peripheral nerve pathology. Okay, so now this may, may be more motor than it is sensory, which is definitely different than diabetes. Now, hear me clearly, which is more sensory than motor. So when somebody comes up and says, I'm weak more than I am sensory, I automatically jump to this test and don't do diabetes. Okay. Anti-myelin, when you have titers for that, it may increase chances for multiple sclerosis and so forth. So when we have GM1 and anti-HSV1, HSV1 is a member of the herpes family. HSV2 is genital herpes. H, H 
V6 lives in the temporal lobes. There's a lot of these guys. We'll talk about all these in our next BTV module. I don't have time to talk about them now, but just remember that this is a neurotropic, neuroinvasive virus, guys, and it's going to create an immune response in your brain. And if that happens, it increases your risk for Alzheimer's disease. And cerebellum, uh, it's been associated with autism. It's been associated with frontal lobe damage because your right cerebellum will coordinate with your uh, left frontal lobe and so forth. And then the cerebellum goes into the part of the brainstem that regulates autonomics, like your heart rate, your heart rhythm, your sweat, your blood vessels, your capillary refill, your ability to have changes when you sit up and sit down in your blood output so that you have enough blood to go to your head so you don't pass out. In these Purkinje cells, these guys are really, really big in regards to regulating the output of deep cerebellar nuclei, and it's been linked to a, a, a really, the, the unfortunate thing is they're, the list of things that these guys are, are linked to in regards to diseases is, is really big. So as we go through here, we find out that we can have a normal cell and have GM1 or any of these other things, and it can react and create antibodies, and we can have molecular mimicry, and then that molecular mimicry can now go across into the brain, and we get things like Guillain-Barre disease, where we get GM1 is attacking right at the nodes of Ron VA, which is, so picture a wire. It's just stripping the plastic off the wire to where now it's just a copper cable or, or whatever material is used. So in my Guillain-Barre patients, which I don't have a lot of, but I always do check GM1 antibodies or GM2 antibodies, and I find a lot of stuff. And when you have GM in the CSF, you have, you've had a T cell that's presented it. And so it can make mast cells depolarize, and now we have histamines, and it makes an immune response bigger than it should be. A monocyte on a CBC is nothing but a macrophage that is still in the blood. It just hasn't gone into the connective tissue yet. Okay, so it can actually screw up the differentiation of macrophages. It can damage dendritic cells so they don't survive, they don't mature, and now they make more cytokines than they do just eat things and be cool. Same thing with neutrophils. And in the lungs, which is what one of the things this patient has, he has GM1 antibodies and he has COPD. And when you look at alveolar macrophages, now we get increased phagocytosis and you don't make good surfactant clearance. Yeah, so they don't repair tissues. And then really endothelial cells anywhere, including the gut, can be screwed up. So this GM1 stuff is really a big deal. Um, I'm going to kind of skip this slide. This just shows what happens. I can go all day on what happens. This is what happens inside the cell whenever it's infected, okay? So we end up having, this is a, the, a, a diffusion. This is the blood-brain barrier, and this is HSV uh, eposomes or cross-reactivity. So now this guy travels, and it goes down. And remember that when we have HSV1 or 2, it can travel up or down the axon and go to where there's innervation or go to the cell body. That's where these HSV viruses live. That's why it can go down to the end organ and create vesicular reactions. And, uh, you know, that's obviously not a good deal. Uh, some of the things that can really treat this is uh, monolaurin, leucovorin. Uh, or Luca, well, actually not that. That's more cancer stuff, and that's more methylation stuff. But we can have virusidin. We can have uh, monolaurin or lorinic acid, which is big, and then we can have colloidal silver. Okay, that slides up there twice. Sorry about that. This is a really scary picture of the cerebellum that I'm not going to go through, but just remember that if we have Purkinje cell antibodies, we lose control of the deep cerebellar nuclei. The other cerebellar antibodies can go to basket cells, stellate, uh, stellate cells, granular cells. There's more really granular cells than there really is any other cell in your entire nervous system. Okay, so the gut can hurt, the brain can hurt, but can it cross-react and make their joints hurt also? So now take a look at this guy. 
This is really the big deal for this patient. So I want you to look at this. 3.1 is the absolute upper limit of norm for highly sensitive C-reactive protein. They're at 18.8. They are inflamed, man. Now their rheumatoid factor is at 223, which is much greater than 15. And I will say that rheumatoid factor IgM is a pretty good marker, but not a great marker. Anti-CCP3 is an excellent marker for rheumatoid arthritis. And we're at 235, and their really upper limit is 40. Now I'm going to give you a couple of things about this patient. This patient drinks Diet Dr. Pepper every freaking day. About like 12 of them, okay? They're allergic to vanilla, and they're eating the artificial sweetener, such as aspartame, which is an excitotoxin, which blows the brain up cell by cell. And it pushes the immune system because they have really the artificial sweetener in there. They have antibodies to it. So I'm not going to get into that because that's not part of this, but, but just look at this. So the cool thing is, is that they're Smith, they're Joe, they're RMP, all of these different antibodies that relate to different um, autoimmune diseases of connective tissue are negative, but this is extremely positive. I like this one right here, DSDNA, because this tells me a lot about pediatric autoimmune encephalitis and it can be a problem. So anyway, you can see this guy has clear rheumatoid arthritis. Like this is pretty diagnosable. This person has a clear gut problem. They have a clear gluten problem. They have a clear peripheral nerve problem. They have a clear cerebellar problem and they have myelin problems. And then last but not least, now they're breaking down their joint tissues. Now, clinically, it's not just, and I mean, so, okay, you, you may say to yourself, okay, they got rheumatoid arthritis, where? Well, their fingers are becoming angulated. That means to the left or the right, not inflection or extension. And they're getting big nodes and in their interphalangeal joints, and they're getting big nodules at the distal end of their radius. And they've had both shoulders uh, have had surgery, and now both knees have had surgery. So all of their connective tissues are breaking down. Why? Could one say that it started in the gut and then turned into an inflammatory response, which permeated, which per uh, perpetrated or, or permeated uh, an inflammatory response, which then made cross reactivity, and now you're attacking your own joints? So here, here's the paradigm you're going to have to deal with. Did this person get RA and now they're taking a biologic that is going to suppress their immune system so badly that they're prone to chronic infection? And they've already got infectious disease. We've already seen it. So if we give them an immunosuppressive drug to stop rheumatoid arthritis, there's a darn good chance that all the infections they have that have triggered this in the first place are going to go through the ceiling and perpetuate their dementia, and perpetuate the inflammatory response in their brain. I want you to think about that when you start looking at the way people are treated in an allopathic model. And, and I have no problem with that, but people need to think about it before they just do it. Okay, so anyway, enough of the soap box. So these anti-CCP, these attack and produce inflammatory symptoms most commonly it's rheumatoid arthritis it's in about 60 to 70 percent of patients and it can be there for years before we end up getting problems that's just kind of what the slide shows boy this is a crazy slide this shows all the different medications and what they do it shows the medications that block IL-17 the ones that block IL-6 the ones that block tumor necrosis factor uh, the ones that block IL-23. I mean, this is a really neat little slide. If you want to look at some of the medications, if some of y'all are into that, you can definitely feel free to look at it. So here's rheumatoid arthritis. It's got its clinical markers. It's got autoantibodies. It damages cartilage. It's, you're probably genetically prone for it. There's an immunological component to this. We've seen that. We've seen brain and we've seen joint. We've seen infectious disease and we've seen joint. We've seen gut breakdown and we've seen joint. Now, eventually these inflammatory cytokines will break down bone. So the person needs a DEXA study. And then inflammatory 
or inflammation is a gimme in all inflammatory diseases. So when we look at this, this is kind of cool because I talked about some of these and I, and I went over them very quickly because I knew this slide was in here. But if we have something like Smith, we have positivity for lupus. If we have something like Joe 1, 30% of these people have polymyositis. I mean, this is a terrible disease. Um, Sjogren's disease is SSA, SSB. These are Sjogren antibodies, A and B. If we have DSDNA, these are double-stranded DNAs. And, uh, you know, this is really big for lupus. It's also really big for autoimmune encephalitis, like I said. Um, so anyway, this is really nice because if, if we're going to test for it, we want to be able to say, look, man, we, you just spent a lot of money or not a lot of money, but some money on this test and it showed up positive. What does that mean? So if you have any of these positive findings, call the lab up. Let somebody like me know. Uh, let somebody like Dr. Barry know. Call Dr. Teams at three in the morning and say, listen, man, I've got a positive Smith antibody. What do I do about this? Be sure you call Dr. Teams every single time. So listen, the thing is this. If you have a bad brain, your gut's going to go downhill. If you've got a bad gut, your brain is going to go downhill. The communicative messengers between this is inflammatory cytokines and the vagal nerve. I'll give you an example of this. They have found in recent literature that Parkinson disease starts by certain types of inflammatory byproducts crawling up the vagal system and going into the brain and damaging the ventral mesencephalon and your substantia nigra does not make dopamine anymore. So we're finding that it's starting out as a gut disease. 80% of your immune system is right there in the guts. So you better take care of it. If you've had diarrhea for a long time, it's time to fix it. If you've had constipation for a long time, it's time to fix it. If you've had any gastrointestinal problem other than normal stools, it's time to fix it. And I used to wonder what my grandma would always ask me when I was a kid, have you had a BM today? And I was like, what's a BM? Well, that was a bowel movement. It's really funny. How some of the old timers knew that if you didn't have a certain biological function day to day, then something bad was going on. So now I find myself asking people about bowel movements whenever, to be quite honest with you, I swore that I would never do that after my grandmother asked me that when I was nine years old. Okay. So the neural zoomer, uh, you know, re really, you know, us here at, at, at Vibrant, we want to just thank you for really getting on this tonight. And I think that we're pretty close to being on time. I don't know. Maybe I went a little bit over. But this is one of our educational webinars. And listen, I gave you more stuff than you could probably digest in a short period of time. But I'm giving you a big picture concept that I want you to understand.